Uh, folks who have joined us here on Zoom, uh, so Cheryl Hayes has joined us today. She's with the Rising, the Rising Tide Initiative, uh, and so she wants to talk to us about, you know, the new norm, you know, and, and how do you, what's your strategy? How do you create a strategy for this new norm of working remotely and communicating uh, with staff and, and, and clients and marketing and things like that? So uh, with that, Cheryl, I'll turn it over to you, and I'll be over here trying to, to problem solve. All right, sounds good. So everybody, hello, welcome, and bear with me while I'm sharing my screen. And hopefully everybody should be, should yep. be seeing my okay. PowerPoint at this point in time. Yeah, okay, yep. great. All right, so everyone, um, today I really wanted to talk to you about the ability to craft, craft your strategy going through this change and then coming out on the other side. And I don't wanna get into a lot of doom and gloom. So I'm gonna be approaching this a couple of different ways. Uh, one, I'm gonna ask you to be pessimistic on some things, but on other things, I'm gonna ask you to say, now that you've identified that, how do you move forward from it? So my goal from this session for you is actually to give you some really useful tools that you can use and some steps that you can take to go through and really understand the components of your strategy and what you need to have answers to before you make some of the decisions. Now, some of you I know may have already made some decisions that you're going, oh, was that the best one? That's okay, you know what, it's a sunk cost. So what we're gonna do is talk about ways to, to move forward on this. I've got a lot to cover. The slides will be available and a list of resources at the end. And then you can always feel free to reach out to me or to the chamber if you've got any additional questions for it. So with that being said, um, one of the things I really want to, to remind you about is the fact that you do have more control than you realize. And no, I'm not gonna read the slides for you. I'm gonna leave that up to you to read. As leaders, however, we run into the same problems that everybody else does and we can make ourselves to where we are acting solely in fear so i brought up this screen to show you what happens uh, when change goes on or grief or any kind of a loss goes on i bet you can identify right now where you are and where a lot of the members on your team are and the problem is as leaders is that we can operate out of fear and become very very reactionary and then we think well I'm hearing a lot of noise from people. I need to make a change. I need to do this. Everybody else is panicking and I'd better lay off everybody or I'd better reach out to my vendors and stop some shipments that are coming in, whatever that came into your mind at first. You're taking a step and you're thinking you're being courageous and taking a step. I wanna challenge you on that because if we operate in fear, we're reactionary, but operating in courage can still be reactionary because it still doesn't give us any logic that was associated with that. And so what I like to do is have us operate as what leaders are supposed to be because if we can't get a handle on being proactive instead of reactive, we cannot guide our team to operate the same way, nor can we guide our vendors and more importantly, our customers and helping this through this, through, through this current situation. You've been in business a long time, many of you, some of you maybe not so long, but everybody understands the need for us to guide our customers. Our goal is to make them heroes in their own, own story. And we cannot do that if we're operating in a purely emotional frame of mind. So when we start talking about strategy, we want to talk about how we're making decisions based on the long run and not just the short run. We've got to look at the both. They're not mutually exclusive. We've got to consider both of them. And I love this old quote from Jack Welch because this is really true today. Things are happening to us faster than we can anticipate on the outside. And it's coming at us from all directions. If we stay stagnant because of fear and hunkering down, then we're going to be passed by. People are buying your product, people are needing your product. The need for that has not gone away. And so if you're not selling right now, you need to understand somebody else is. Because that has happened in every kind of downturn that we have, you see people within the same type of industry that are prospering and that those that are not prospering and are failing on their businesses. So we're gonna talk about understanding your current market, 
identifying your win and what that really looks like from this point moving forward and ensuring you having the right resources. Going to spend a lot of time in there because there are some very specific tools I'm going to introduce you to that you need to utilize as you're going through and answering these questions. And if you have any questions, by the way, I believe that you can go on and uh, submit them on Facebook and uh, maybe on the, the chat here. Um, well, let me so let me jump in there real quick, right. Cheryl, uh, because we're again, we're still having difficulty on the on the Facebook uh, and that communication. So we're not we're not on the Facebook, but uh, we should be able to do some Q&A in the Zoom for the, the participants we have uh, in the Zoom with us. OK, perfect. Thank you so much. So work with me here. I want you to put aside what is going on and has gotten us to this point right now. I want you to suspend where you are. What I want you to think about is forward thinking. So we're actually, I'm going to bring in some of the strategies you've already put in place, but in your mind, I want you to think if I am starting my business from today, what has changed from today moving forward? because everything the showing is that we're probably going to take at least three quarters to recover from this, maybe two. I'm not an economist. I read everything just like you do. But I also can look at history and understand what happened after 9-11, what happened after 2009, um, what has going to happen to us now. We have a steep plunge and then we have uh, an opportunity within usually a year, year and a half. Everything is actually back above where it was before. And so the economy is still going to move forward and your business can still thrive in this actual situation. So your focus is going to be on moving forward on here and trying to determine at this point in time, what is your mindset? Are you just looking at hunkering down and surviving through this? Or are you willing to actually look at an opportunity to say, how do I pivot and how do I grow my business? Because if we have the wrong mindset, we can doom ourselves to failure, even though that would not more necessarily be the, be the case. So the first thing I want you to introduce you to, because I'm going to ask you to use this model throughout all the questions I'm going to be posing to you and asking. So when you get back in your office and you're working with your team on your Zoom meetings, I want you to use this. This model came from the secretary, uh, prior, prior Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld. And you may have seen this used in some other areas, but I really felt it was applicable here in helping us understand what strategy should be and separating fact from fiction and what's going on. And I use this in working with a lot of the small businesses on helping them separate their facts from their assumptions that they're making specifically about their market and their customer. So you have your four quadrants here that you're going to be asking your team to answer in the questions moving forward. But I just wanted to show this to you real quick. Your known knowns, is it a truth or an assumption? And I want to kind of give you an idea um, how this applies. So in sales, I've heard people say, oh, it's really kind of insensitive to sell right now. Maybe we should hold off and maybe we shouldn't sell. So I want to ask you something. What is your assumption? that people buying your product is somehow going to be an inconvenience for them and not help them? Or is your known that your product or service could actually be the one thing that helps keep that customer solvent, that helps them reduce cost? So where is your mindset? What are you making as, as an assumption? You might hear people say, you know, nobody's buying. Well, that's not true. Somebody's buying your product and service. They just may not be buying it from you. The need has not gone away. Fear has taken over and allowed people to move into stagnation, but it doesn't mean they do not still need your product. And then what is unknown, but that known? What does your team know that you may not? What do they know about your customers and where they are? What do your customers know? Are your customers having an increase in sales? Do you even know that? What is impacting them? And so these are questions that you're going to be asking yourself as you move through in each of the quadrants of the strategy. And then from your answers from these questions, you're going to be able to determine a really good set of steps to move forward. So you'll see how this kind of works out, I think, as we go along. So the first thing that I want you to, to uh, really think about is where you're active. Right. What are your um, with your customers and your current market? Pick up the phone, folks. Give them a call. 
establish contact with them. I know you're seeing this. This is nothing new that I'm telling you, except that I'm hoping I'm going to give you a few other questions that you really want to find out from people. When you're talking to your customers, you want to find out some things. So how is this impacting them? How is it impacting their customers? How has it changed what their goals are for the year? What is their state of mind? Are they operating still in fear? And have they hunkered back? Or are they looking at opportunity? Uh, there are a couple of other questions that I really want you to, to, to think about. And I don't want to go too fast on these. Like I said, I have a lot of stuff to cover on here. But I want you to make a list with your team of the kind of questions that are going to give you information about your customer that is based on where your customer is today and where they see themselves at the end of the year. These are not questions designed to say, how can my product or service help them? This isn't a sales call. It's not a marketing call. It's an I care about you call. You've been a good customer. We have helped each other. Our product or service allowed you to be successful in these ways. What is going on with you right now? Mm -hmm. That means even the customers that aren't paying, because sometimes we look at accounts payable being, okay, I've really got cash flow issues and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But we also have people that um, think they, they either have to pay it all or they can't pay anything. This is an opportunity to be creative with your customers and reach out as you're looking for help, so are they. So make it easy for people to do business with you. And the first way we do that is by reestablishing that personal connection for them. Now, as you're finding out sure. this, this information, yes. If I can stop you right there, I just want a quick technical note here uh, for our viewers. So we have uh, reestablished the Q&A portion of this. It might not be showing up on your screen at, uh, at the bottom, uh, but if you do have a question, you'll, you'll have to step back, uh, log out, and then log back in to it uh, to have a question. So apologize for the technical difficulties on this, but anybody who did have a question, I want to make sure that we saw that. So that's what I got. Cheryl, go back ahead. And, oh, no, perfect. Any, any time. All right. So you need to come up with the questions that are most relevant to helping your customers. That's one side of the equation. But when you're reaching out to the customers, there are other things that you need to be able to find out. I can't tell you what all of those are because you know, I don't know you and I don't know your business, but I can ask you a couple of questions. How confident is your client in your ability to meet their changing needs based on this? Did they see your product or solution as something that helped them pre January? Do they see how your product or service or your solution helps them today? Do you even understand that? And then the next most important question is, does your team understand that? How your product or service is beneficial today? These sound like uh, general type of questions everybody should know, but I can tell you I have listened and watched sales teams that are afraid to sell. And so that tells me that there's some fear going on that we need to address at all levels. Your customers are also afraid. And a lot of times you're gonna see, and I'll probably mention this a couple of times, got this tip from a really good, um, a, a wonderful salesperson does sales training uh, here in our area, Jason Forrest. And he said, you need to give people permission to buy from you because they're operating in a state of fear and they're looking for guidance on why they should, is this a good use of my money at this particular point in time? I need you to also go back and I call this whole section re-identifying with your customer. I want you to put aside the, the assumptions or what you think you knew on why they bought from you. You need to establish why they would need to buy from you now and what's going on that can help you now. So why were you successful in this market? Why did the people buy from you in the first place, right? And then we're going to tie this in to actually looking into a Venn diagram. Don't know if any of you have ever done a Venn diagram. I highly recommend them. It can be kind of down and dirty and it can be a lot of fun um, to, to actually do this. However you look at it, I can tell you it can be very, very critical for you at this point in time. A Venn diagram is simply an intersection of different interests, and it gives you some ideas on how to go back and interact with your customer, why your customer is actually buying from you. But more importantly, something people do not use the Venn for is two areas. One, if you can look on my screen, you'll see under customers, it says this unmet, undiscovered customer needs. That means that you, the company at the top, 
You've identified all your strengths and weaknesses. Um, you've identified all of your feature benefits from your product or service. And over in the points of, of difference for your company and your customers, it's actually where they kind of meet. And that's why your customers are buying from you. But there may be other things your customers need that you're not providing or that you do provide and you have not shared with them that you provide that. So that's that dark purple area in the customer, the dark blue area in the customer. The dark purple area in you are those features and benefits that you thought, wow, everybody needs this. And then you started realizing you offer it. People expect it, but they're not buying you solely for that. That's like this nice value add that you're giving to them. There's opportunity in both of these sections. One, if you already have a product or a service mix that is not the key focus for a customer, it's a nice to have, there may be another customer that it would be that key focus for. So the whole area right up in here is opportunity for you to expand your market. This area down in here is an opportunity for you to take complementary products and introduce to help your customer with a more well-rounded solution. It also is where you're gonna start finding out what are the, the additional problems that they're facing or what problems have been exacerbated because of the current situation. So no matter how you look at this, it's an opportunity in and in, not just to realize where you are, but to look at at least two different areas where you can expand your current market. So I want you in identifying what does a win look like, I want you to have talked to your customers. I want you to find out what their struggles are right now. Don't say, here's how we can help you. You're just collecting knowledge at this point in time. You're reestablishing contact with them. You're letting them know maybe some of the things that you are doing, your employees are doing, if y'all are giving back or how you're making sure that you're handling your installations, if that's a concern or people shopping with you. But it's mainly just to connect Focus on them. Remind them that you are partners with them in solving their prior problems and you're a partner with them now. Then you're going to look at what your competition is doing. You're gonna look at what you're doing, why you think people have bought from you, and then listen to what you found out from your existing customers to say, well, maybe there's a different reason they're buying from us. And then you're gonna brainstorm with your team to say, okay, what else do we have that they may need based on these problems that we're hearing? or what other type of customer may need our service now that we're identifying all these strengths and weaknesses that we have. So you're rolling these things together as you're beginning to build some data to form your strategy. So the next thing that you're going to do is start identifying now, what do we think people are needing from us right now? Why does that solve the problem for them? Why does it solve the problem the best way for them? I always find it fascinating when I'm talking to people and they tell me what they do, but they cannot tell me how they actually use their product or service to make the customer a hero. And a good friend of mine that does Story Brand, that's a great book to read. He's, he is licensed for it um, and he's, he's here local. He said, that's the problem we have. We forget our role in our product and service is not necessarily just to make ourselves successful, is that we make ourselves successful by making our customers the heroes in their own story. And this is a time more than ever that we need to go back and we really need to focus on that. So you need to be able to help your customers see a win through this because a lot of people are struggling and they don't. They don't see a path through the chaos. If anybody lives here in the Metroplex and you remember what went on with North Loop 820 um, and all the construction that we had and what's going on in 35, I'll tell you, I use that as a, a great um, teaching tool when I'm talking about change with companies because there are two types of change. You have to be able to see the change at the end. What is that final project gonna look like? So we need to be able to see what we look like on the outside of the slower, slower economy. But we also need to be able to see our change moving through it. How do we navigate through it? You have to help your customers do the same thing. So all these things I'm telling you today, you need to take back to your customer. So what does a win look like? Look at your product and service from their standpoint based on what you just found out talking to them. Do you have another solution? Can you maybe help them with cash flow if that's an issue for them uh, through some creative buying strategies or opportunities? 
or reducing their accounts payable monthly payments to you. Can you provide insights or connections to them to help them be successful with their customer that they may not have thought about before? So now more than ever, you can be called to be an advisor for people. One of the interesting things is that if you share your value, um, with your customer and your principles with your customer, they typically buy from you. You know, over 80% of us buy from a company because we feel that we share their values with them. Um, Loyalty Lion just came out and said that actually 68% of customers are motivated to stay with us when they feel aligned with our values. So they're not going to go away, but they may if they don't feel the help and they don't feel the connection with you going on. So your connection to them at this point in time is really important. I want you to then look at that competitive advantage and you need to know who needs those other strengths. That becomes another great call for your customer, especially your top customers to say, hey, what else are you struggling with and how can we help you with that kind of environment? Again, I'm not going to talk to you about a sales product by right now, but you've got product and service <laughs> knowledge and some technical knowledge and industry knowledge that they may need to know. So you want to leverage that in your first few conversations with your customer to reestablish you're a vital advisor to them as you move forward. It gets back to your perspective. Remember, not everybody in your industry is faltering. Um, some are being successful. You want to be one of those people that's being successful. So as you're developing your strategy, first thing, re-identify your customer. Don't go by what you thought you knew. You need to re-identify and re-establish your existing customer, really, why now? And then who else in that same type of customer group and then identify another customer segment from those other strengths that you bring to the table that you have not utilized. Once you've done that, you need to move in to say, okay, I know I have a market out there. I feel pretty confident that people need my product or service today more than ever. Now, for some of you thinking, oh, yeah, great. Well, I'm in the entertainment industry. I can tell you, for all of us that are staying at home with little kids, we desperately need that. You have an escape room, do a virtual online escape room. Get people set up. Uh, I was talking to my intern. Um, he's in college. He can't do anything with his buddies. They're all stuck at their own home. They are desperate for something to do online. So there's opportunity amidst all this chaos if we tend to look at what we can control and what we can influence versus what is just the chaos that is making us adrift. So once we've done that, now we're going to move into identifying what the resources are because you know you can talk to your customers all you want, but here's the real struggle. A lot of us are saying, I don't have the cash, I don't have the runway. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. The scorecard I'm going to get back to, but I've listed some things that if you're not using a scorecard or that if your scorecard is incomplete, you really, depending on your um, product or service, need to be identifying and looking at things weekly, if not daily, to help you understand. So I've just listed those to the side. But let's talk about really specifically about cash flow, freeing up cash flow. All right. So I want you to, I'm going to be my pest, put my pessimist hat on. I want you to think about having reduced cash flow at minimum through the end of the year, and it may be a little bit more. That's not a killer, folks. It just is. It's neither good nor bad. It just is. And so, like Gandalf said, it's up to us what we're going to do with it. So I, I realize that this can be a little bit hard, but we're going to identify your minimum, and then I'm going to tell you, okay, that's great. It's a minimum, but we really need to work on what your real goals are. And I'm not going to leave you here at the minimum. So what do you need to do? You need to look at your current burn rate, right? What does it really, really take you? So lay us down everything that you're paying. Some of you have already done this, I understand. What are you paying monthly? But then go through and say, all right, I need to eliminate. If I need to eliminate, I'm going to give you a few um, key uh, metrics to do as we go through this at my activity at the end. So bear with me. Uh, you're going to look at your budget, what is essential and non-essential. You're going to look at your current runway based on what is essential, removing everything that is non-essential from it. And then let's talk about some specific ways that you can free up um, what your cash flow is. Because I want you to be creative one on how to get receivables, but there are also many other things that you can do. I want you to say what can be reduced. So let's look at this. Can I cancel no or low, no low benefit expenses? What in there can, can I um, work with where I'm sharing an office and redo my lease? 
to make it a smaller person office? Is there a way that I can give back the copier and bring my old my printer copier in from home? There are always ways that we can cut expenses right now, depending on where you are in your burn rate that you need to reduce. The goal would be to extend your runway out for as many months as possible. So the first thing, because we all work this way, we look at the negative. So what do I have to cut? So here are some other things. Can you reduce your own personal draw? Can you ask your employees to take a cut in salary at this moment, but you're still able to keep them on and it's still above what they would be making if they needed to turn in for unemployment? And we're going to talk about really being smart about your employees in, in just a moment. So again, I can't give you all the answers, but I can tell you, look at what you can reduce first, but then let's really focus on what you can increase. Are there different payment methods that you can offer to continue to get some cash flow coming in? Have you reached out and been in conversations with your vendors, suppliers, lenders to say, all right, how do I restructure? Can I slow down? Can I cut a, a, um, an order in half right now? Because right, right now, I haven't been reaching out and doing a lot of sales, and so I think my inventory flip is going to be a little bit lower. So people are willing to work with you because guess what? They're all in the same boat at this point in time, and most of us would rather see something versus nothing. And so line that up. Even if you don't have to take advantage of it right now, these are, are, are um, pieces of knowledge that you need to identify so that if for some reason the economy does get worse, you're prepared. This is to create your disaster preparedness plan. And of course, the care stimulus is really critical. There's a lot of great um, information out there. In fact, we were just talking earlier, and I, I believe um, uh, I'm going to have you, you jump in, uh, Chris, that six billion, or was it six million in, in uh, loan requests even already this morning with some local entities? Yeah, uh, so we had heard that 58,000 small businesses have applied for $6 billion worth of funding since 9 a.m. this morning. So, so yeah, if you're a small business, yeah, definitely get on it right now. Yeah. Um, and two weeks ago, the chamber had Kim with the SBDC out talking about how you, how you apply for it. Um, it's in a list of resources I'm providing. I know the chamber has those resources for you, but there are some great advantages in there because it's not all loans. A lot of it is a loan forgiveness. So it becomes an actual grant opportunity. So you want to make sure that you're aware of that. Also on my resource page, I have listed a lot of other resources that are available uh, that you can go through other grants and opportunities to help small business. I would ask you when you're looking at your burn rate and laying out the essential, I want you to remember though, go on and try to plug in for your paying Uncle Sam. Even though we may be able to put that on hold for a while, at some point in time, taxes are still gonna be due. And so our, go on and keep planning for what, 415, uh, 615, September 15th um, type of, of payments to put back, plan for that. I want you to also consider creating another GL account, and I want you to start tracking every single COVID-related expense that you're under, that you're having to go through. Because I would imagine at some point in time, this is going to be needed when you're going in and proving, um, or when you're filing your taxes or taking things off. It's gonna help your accountant, it might help you in the taxes, it may help you in, in showing why you can turn a loan into a grant forgiveness under the CARES program. So just a good rule of thumb, start tracking all these expenses. If you had to buy Zoom for everybody now in your office, better be tracking that as a separate COVID expense. I want you to think about, um, a lot of times we look at both in reducing and increasing is that we wanna leverage our credit cards and leverage our debt, right? I know that that's needed sometimes and debt can be very, very healthy but you need to understand where your debt equity is and looking at that and saying, based on my runway and my ability to repay, how much is that debt costing me? Because at some point in time, you may find it's costing you more than equity um, in your company. That, and I'm not saying give away shares in your company. What I'm saying is look alternatively at how can I reduce some expenses, even the ones that I felt were fixed before you start having to leverage debt. I was talking to a company the other day, they were using their credit cards for general operating expenses. Not a good idea. And so um, put them in contact with some other people that were able to help them figure out a way from that mess. So what can be reduced? Uh, work with your vendors, payment reduction, interest only payments, uh, renegotiate terms, consider some debt refinancing if you need to. 
I'd ask you to consider not reducing the type of expenses that are tried, tied directly to your sales growth at this point in time, unless once we get to the next step in evaluating your team, you realize that you don't have the right people in your sales or perhaps too many people. But this is not the right time to cut out what's gonna actually bring you the revenue in. And again, that may seem that, uh, duh, we should know that, but a lot of people have acted in a reactionary mode and are laying off people and they're not really going through the logic on how do I determine who uh, I should let go and who I should be keeping. So just a rule of thumb on that one. So we've identified our customers, we've re-identified with our existing ones and we've identified new ones. We're starting to identify the resources to be done. We're now wanting to make sure that we're looking at that saying, okay, what are my new sales goals that I need to have? So when I'm looking at my sales go goals, I, I want you to think about them a little bit differently, daily, monthly, quarterly. And that's gonna be in addition to looking at your sales funnel. But we wanna make sure that you stay, um, your cash flow stays coming in to help you as you're moving through the next series of months. I need you to understand the difference between what you minimally need and what you want. If your focus is only on what you minimally Ah, I can't even say that word. It, uh, if your focus is only on what you absolutely have to have, but nothing more, and you share that with the sales team, and that is your perspective going forward, the odds of you making that are that you just make it and maybe fall just a little bit under. But if you will set your sights still back on what you want to accomplish by the end of the year, that you're wanting to still grow your business, you may be different in how you accomplish that, but the goal is still to grow then that's where I want your site to be. That's where I want you to balance being the pessimist with being the optimist. So where should your focus be on this? If I'm looking at your sales goal. You've identified your customers. We haven't come up with a marketing strategy yet, and I haven't asked you to go back into that uncertainty uh, quadrant and answer all the questions to help you bid the, build this because we still have to evaluate your team. We need to evaluate uh, what your message would be moving forward. But all these components need to be answered. They're just not all sequential. A lot of these things are done consecutively. My apologies for that. Um, That's so a fabulous let's, let's, you got there. Just I know, I know. <laughs> I am so sorry. And I was trying to go so fast on this, everyone. So bear with me and I will, I will move forward. There's just a lot I wanted to share with you. All right, so I want you to evaluate your team. Now this one, guys, it, Take a pad and pencil if you don't have anything else. This is very, very important. I don't want you to react and lay off your team. I don't want you to react and say, okay, well, these are the lowest hanging fruit. I'm gonna get rid of them. I want you to be proactive in understanding logic and the strategy that goes into analyzing what your team should look like. So if you are starting your business from today, I need you to understand what are the critical roles that you have to have today. What are the people doing in those roles? Do not assign a name to them, right? We're taking this from traction. It's something that my firm, uh, we implement and help others with. So write, you wanna find out what roles do I absolutely have to have? Now, again, I'm gonna ask you to do this in several different scenarios, but right now identify those roles. What are the right seats that you have to have moving forward? What are the right tasks associated with those seats? Because there may be tasks that you have an individual doing that only a third of what they're doing is really critical to the ongoing operations of your company. The rest can wait or it can be held off or it can be given to somebody else. So you're gonna identify the right roles. You're gonna identify the task within those roles. And only then are you going to start saying, who do I have that's the best fit for them? If you assign names up front, don't do this, after this exercise because nothing will change for you because you may find out that people that were doing the role prior to this situation are not gonna be the best suited people to take you to the next level through this situation. So you need to look at them and look at their strengths and weaknesses and assign the best person for these new roles. You need to also understand with your team, where are they in the change process? Are they still operating in fear? Are they afraid to sell? Um, and and uh, mention a, a couple of things from, from that standpoint. Um, how can you help them see their way out? Because if you cannot re-engage your team and make them operate in a less fearful way, then there's no way you're gonna be able to get your team to help you save your company and move your company forward into growth. 
So here's what I want you to do. You've evaluated your customers, you've evaluated your resources, you've looked for ways to free up your resources. I want you to put the resources you're freeing up not only as a safety cushion, but to help you now grow your sales. So we're evaluating our team, we're realigning our team as we need to. So now I want you to create a pro forma. I want you to create this pro forma budget based on a 60, 40, or 20% reduction in revenue from now through at least the end of the year. Do all three of them. And do more if you want to. Look back at what you decided in your budget was critical, and then say what of my critical stuff needs to be cut when my revenue has dropped an additional 20%. So you're going to have certain things that you're keeping if you're making 80% of revenue, that when you drop to 60%, those things have to slide. Or the quality of it, the level of it has to slide. And so you're gonna to need to go through that. So you were taking, we're weighting each of those in relationship to the decrease in potential revenue that we're having. And you're looking at each of the roles of your team to say what is critical at each of these levels. And then how would I combine those tasks if I need to let additional people go along the way. So that's a big undertaking for you to do, but that is a critical activity that you need to do if you're going to understand how to get your strategy in place and how you're going to move forward. So at least to see these things through the end of the year. Right? So now that you've identified this, we're re-engaging our team. We're trying to ask our team, how do you think our product and service helps people? Do you think this is a good time to sell? We're going to lead them through that uncertainty chart to say, help us craft the right message as we're reaching back out to our customers. Again, your sales team may be taking the stint that, well, nobody's buying. Everybody's hunkered down. Ask them, so where did you get that data? Who exactly is everybody? And you may find out they've talked to two customers and they're making an assumption based on that. The next thing I want you to do is work on crafting your message. Right message. We've talked about those as we've moved through. The right medium is a great time to reach back out and utilize all types of social media and be very creative with it. You wanna see some creative media, I urge you to reach one of our local vendors, um, Saddleback Leather, look at their YouTube. It is a fun, engaging way to get people to understand their product and they don't sell their product at all. And what they do is they talk about what happens when a um, lesser quality tries to mimic the quality that they bring to the table. They do it in a fun way. So reach out to your customers through a lot of different ways. Get your customers engaged in your selling process by doing the um, how did we help you, how are we helping you through this type of scenario. Again, your focus is on helping and informing people as they go through. While you're doing this and getting your team engaged in all these levels in here, you know, I keep mentioning, have your team go through and answer this. You need to be as open with your team as possible. You need to share with them those scenarios. You need to say, so here's where we are, here's the reality. How do we work together to change this? While they're looking for you for direction, you don't want a team that only looks to you for answers. Your team needs to be part of the solution that you have. And they need to understand what happens at each level so they can help you work through it. You don't want to scare them off. So share what you can, share when you can, and I can't answer that one for you. You're going to have to figure that one out for yourself. Remember, it's not selfish to sell during this time. It can actually be selfish to not sell your product at this time, if it really can help people. It's what your perspective is, what your sales team's perspective is, and it's what your customer's perspective is about what you're bringing to the table. You want to look at your existing marketing. This is a great time to go back and look at the existing problems that are going on in your, um, your social media that, you're, that you have. You need to make it easy for people to do business with you based on the situation today. So the messages that you've had in the past may not be relevant any longer. Don't just assume your same website is, does it need to be updated? your whole message, the whole way you're delivering your message, the whole way you're selling. And you wanna be careful, you wanna use that uncertainty model and plug through things that you don't know. For example, I reached out to a restaurant, local restaurant, they sent out a great email about Easter dinner. I thought, this sounds great, I'm gonna order it. Press the button to look at the menu and took me to the menu and no way to order. And it didn't even say you have to call locally. It was just the menu. And so I reached out, I sent an email to the company, the corporate headquarters said, yeah, great idea. And you know what, we'll have somebody call you. And I haven't heard from them. So if you're gonna make it easy for people to do business with you, please, please, please make it easy. 
All right, make sure you step through the process, make sure you make the process as easy as possible for people so that they can go through and do that. Um, again, I just wanted to reiterate that proactively market and address um, your concerns, how you're doing things, how you're handling things. Uh, a couple of great ideas if you're in retail, uh, there's a firm up in Nebraska, uh, small, small companies. What she's doing is she, her, her store will hold five people at a time. So she says, shop with a friend five feet. You have to stay six feet apart. She wipes everything down after they wear gloves while they're shopping for it. And so she's able to stay open. Um, talk to another entity, a car shop uh, dealership. They are picking up your car and will take it and get it fixed for you. There are ways to still proactively connect with your customers and make it easy for them. You just have to identify what that is and what that's going to work for you. And if nothing else, for sure find out what your competitors are doing so that you can do something different and you can find out how they're staying in business. This is a great time. You look at history and I have examples I don't have time to get into. But in all cases, there are people that have prospered and moved their market up during this time. And it's not just because they were selling face masks. You're going to find jewelry departments that are very successful during this time. You think, who's getting out to buy jewelry? So it just depends on your perception and what you're doing with that. So as you've crafted this strategy, you've got to set now what moves because you've looked at your resources, you've looked at your people, you now should have an idea on where I need to make changes in my marketing, where I need to focus my sales team, where I need to focus my, my support team to start moving forward on your message. So you need to identify the sequence of steps that you need to take first. You need to put those scorecards in place. You need to use your scenarios. Those are really critical for that what if analysis so that if something happens, you go back to it and say, okay, now what do I need to do? How did I identify what steps I would take at that particular point in time? So now you're being proactive again without being reactive. You need to monitor always and leverage your resources, not just what your sales metrics are telling you, but understand where your resources are and what you can draw on to get you through the next time. Use your strategy as a game plan. If you play football or if you watch football, you know they have a whole strategy based on the team and based on who's healthy and based on who they're playing against. We know who we're playing against. We just don't know all the effects of it. So you're gonna have a multitude of strategies. That's what I've led you through. You've identified key players. You identified the types of customers that you're gonna be best suited for. You need to implement the strategy a little at a time, measure it, monitor it, and pivot, and then change what you need to. But at each time, you should go back and capitalize on what did work, see how you redeploy that in a different way. That means you've got to have weekly, if not daily conversations with your team. It's not just how's everybody doing, though that's important. Make your team very, very, your meetings very, very strategic. Are we on goal? Are we not? Why are we off? And then talk about how you would solve those specific issues. So make your team meetings more effective than you ever have before. Again, I would lead you back to Traction. They have an excellent model for leading your team forward and identifying what goals need to be worked on critically and then helping each other solve the problems that would be a blocker and helping you fix that. So thank you. I know I went through this fast, took a little longer than I expected to, my apologies for that. I wanted to end with this last slide uh, because we feel right now we're in that bottom quadrant. We feel that there is a high probability and a high impact that risk is going to take us down. If you're operating in that, your team will and your customers will and we'll all go down. So you need to change your mindset and say, I'm not just going to be courageous, but I'm going to lead through this change by understanding the market, doing some research, pulling from the strengths of my team. And your team is not just the people that report to you. It is your vendors. It is the people on your board. It is your investors. It is other people in the industry that have a complementary product that you could partner with to say, how do we work together to help through this? And it's for sure your customers on here so that we can move ourselves back up as we're proactive to where there may be a high probability of some risk, but we are saying the risk itself is not going to be detrimental, so detrimental to us that we don't move forward. So I hope I've given you um, some good tools, the Venn diagram, the uncertainty model, the steps in a strategy, the components in a strategy, and we'll open it up to any questions if there are any.
Well, great. Thank you very much. That was a lot of information, but a lot of really good information. And, you know, apologize we couldn't get on Facebook Live, but uh, as we've done before, this will be, this is being recorded and we're going to put it out there. Uh, we do have a, a couple of questions here, which I'm pretty sure that you you covered as we were going here, but I'm going to ask them anyway, and maybe you can just uh, kind of summarize uh, some of these things again. Um, give a few ideas on how to motivate your team while working remotely. I know you mentioned that in a couple of different places, but maybe if there's three or four bullet points that you could share with the folks. Sure. So when you're motivating your team and working remote, one of the first things to do is the, when you engage them in a conversation, you do need to do that emotional connection. So how are things going? How are you feeling? Right? What is your struggle today? And make it okay. So you start with that yourself. Here's what I'm struggling with today. I cannot focus today. Uh, my mind is not on work because I was listening to whatever. So you share with them first and then you ask them. And then you're going to have your meeting agenda a little bit more structured to where you can say, okay, collectively we need to solve this problem. So here's what we're looking for. How do we feel about sales? How do we feel our sales uh, about our product and service and who needs it now? And has that changed? So you want to engage them by simply asking questions, not telling, not sharing the information. Those are all strategies that we also know. But another good component that we've utilized is to actually give people in the team a chance to run a particular question. And they fill the question and they come up with the answers and then need to report back to the team to say, here is the collective response for it. So that I'm again engaging my team uh, since it's very, very difficult to keep a lot of uh, discussion going back and forth for it. So there are a couple of ways that you can do it from that standpoint. Um, if anybody else has them, I'm always open to them, but that's right off the top of my head. Great, great. So uh, second question we have here, um, should I meet more frequently with my staff during this time? I know that I am, and I know that my staff really appreciates it. Uh, yeah, but uh, I'm, I'm assuming that that is the case, or is there a more strategic way of, of meeting with the staff versus uh, every day or twice a day? Is there just a more efficient way of doing it? Okay, so we reach out a couple of different ways. So it is important to reach out, I think, daily. Uh, we do a little email check-in pulse for our team. How's everybody feeling today? Did you accomplish your goals yesterday? What were, you know, so it's today I put in, what are my goals for today? Did I accomplish my goals from yesterday? And how am I feeling about it? What are my blockers? And we just answer those questions. It's not a team meeting, but it is a way for us using technology to reach out. We also have our weekly meetings and we've kept our, week, our, our meetings weekly because they're 90 minutes in length. That is our standard um, meeting that we go through. Here are the outstanding action items. Here are the goals that they're supposed to be accomplishing. So it's not just an action item tied to my busy work. Um, the action items that we report on are from our strategy. What did we identify needed to be done? What changed and needs to be done for me to make my sales goals by December? And so I report on those. I'm on track or off track. If I'm off, then we talk about it and we discuss how to solve that because somebody else may be able to help me. So those are two types of, of one's our long meeting, one is our daily thing. And then we are reaching out several times a week, um, um, either through Zoom or we'll just do it through our chat channels, um, you know, certainly using Slack and, and using others uh, mechanism, uh, WhatsApp, to come in and say, okay, here's the issue I'm dealing with now. Or I'm getting ready to be on this conference call with this person now. So we're, we're not reaching out the same way. We are reaching out more, but it's very, very structured on two of them. And then it's open as needed on the others. Great. And the last uh, question here, it, it may it's more of a statement than anything, but feel free to elaborate. Uh, somebody should tell Chris Strayer he's pretty awesome. And that I'm not lying. That's actually on here. So, <laughs> no, well, I, I think he is too. <laughs> and, so, and, the, and the chambers. <laughs> well, Cheryl, thank you very much for taking the time to come on here and, and visit with us and give us all this great information. Like I said, we're going to, uh, this is being recorded. We're going to put it on Facebook. Uh, so it should be up there momentarily. And as we get questions in, I'm sure we'll be reaching out to you for some guidance and some best practices to get back to our members and really anybody uh, who's got questions on, on this topic. So thank yeah, you very much. Would thank you and would love to uh, really lead you through actually what the components are of that strategy and how you would apply this to your particular business. That's what I'm here for.
Great. Uh, so in closing, I just want to share a couple of things. Uh, we have a, another slate of, uh, of these Facebook lives, hopefully, uh, if, we, if the technology works with us uh, next week. But Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, we have the SBA, uh, Herb Austin from the SBA, the district director uh, for the SBA here in the DFW area. He'll be back on answering questions. And I know that is a important topic for everyone. So he'll be on Tuesday at 2 p.m. So please join us then. And then I also want to announce uh, something that we're going to do a little bit differently on Fridays. Uh, on our LinkedIn page, we're going to have a discussion forum, uh, an online office hours, if you will, where we're going to pose a topic. And starting at 10 uh, a.m., we're going to pose that topic and then let uh, folks you know, ask those questions. And then we're going to have uh, experts uh, just answer those questions throughout the day. So uh, that's a really exciting thing that we're unveiling here next Friday. So we're going to be talking about shelter in place and, and how, to, how to do that you know, like we just talked talked about. Um, so thank you again, Cheryl. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Have a great weekend and we'll, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.